The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Remember when Miranda Lambert had to make Crazy Ex-Girlfriends cool again? We're gonna talk about the movie that made that necessary. My Best Friend's Wedding. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. And we are here to talk about the Julia Roberts vehicle. My best friend's wedding. Yes, that's right. Very exciting. Let's try to get a very basic plot synopsis out of the way. Ford, you want to start us off there? Sure. Julia Roberts is a food critic because since this is a romantic comedy, the lead female can't have a real job. She has to have a job where she makes a ton of money but doesn't actually have to do anything so that, you know, she can disappear for days at a time. She is single because she's been busy being all emotionally unavailable and feminist and shit. And she gets a call from someone who's supposedly her best friend, Dermot Mulroney, who has ostensibly been in love with her since they had a fling, which was about a decade ago at this point. He says, I'm getting married in 72 hours. And she realizes that... She's in love with him and flies to Chicago to break up his wedding to 20-year-old college student Cameron Diaz. Ultimately, she fails and Dermot Mulroney chooses Cameron Diaz because Cameron Diaz is willing to give up her career. Here's my uh, plot synopsis, if you're curious. Basically Godfather 2, except with Julia Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> Because this is, this is essentially one person's descent into madness and continually doing things that they are surprised they are able to sink to the level of. <laughs> Let's go through our what-the-fuck moments. Why don't you start us out? Cameron Diaz doesn't understand what sunglasses are for. Those fucking opening credits. Russian roulette karaoke. This movie somehow fails the Bechdel test. W what the... Uh, is this a musical now? What the fuck? <laughs> Creme brulee can never be jello. <laughs> the owner of a cable company and Major League Baseball team doesn't have a password on his work computer. The impromptu a cappella helium huffing John Denver tribute <laughs> band. <laughs> Julia Roberts also doesn't understand what sunglasses are for. Women, right? <laughs> right. In the Department of Redundancy Department, we not only hear about an ice fellatio joke, but then we get to see it. Christ, that's a lot of balloons. Julia Roberts' god-awful hair-raising cackle. And finally, thank you. Thank you for loving me enough to commit electronic mail fraud and try repeatedly to ruin my life. You're welcome, Dermot Mulroney. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start by unpacking those opening credits. Okay. I think that's a good place to start. I was wondering, is this a religious metaphor? Because the opening credits is a bride and three bridesmaids, and they are singing about how to be a good wife, and then at one point, a giant white light shines right. on them, and they seem to get much happier at that point. So I was like, wait, is, is this a film about becoming a nun? For those of you to whom this means something, there's a bride and three bridesmaids lip-syncing to a cover of Hopin' and Wishin', which is the second least feminist song after Blurred Lines, covered by Ani DeFranco. So it was just total mental mindfuck for me right there at the very beginning. And at one point, they do the, like, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil thing the three bridesmaids do, and it was jarring. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, Ani DeFranco, I really want to hear that pitch where they told her, we want you to <laughs> sing this, right? I'd just love to have been in on that meeting. So the whole conceit that this hinges around, because, of course, romantic comedy needs a, a kind of ridiculous conceit, and it's odd because the conceit here actually seems pretty believable, I thought. So the conceit is that Dermot Mulroney and Julia Roberts have kind of sort of been in love for over a decade, but because she's distant and blah, 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 it, w it was never going to work out. But they both apparently like made a blood swear or something in the past right. where if they were both unmarried at the age of 28... 28. Well, they they would get married. Blood back and to 28. My question was, why wasn't it 30? 28 seems so really arbitrary. It does. Were the writers like, oh, if we make them 30, they're too old? 28 is actually the average age for men in America to get married. Ah. So that's the average. That means fully half of people get married for the first time after that age. 
That like doesn't really seem yeah. like the time that you should start panicking about being alone forever. I guess the idea is that when you're 18, it seems like a long way in the future, right? Yeah, I guess. Stupid teenager. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just in general sort of didn't really understand who this movie was for. And I mean, obviously it was for a lot of people because everyone loves it. People who love chick flicks and don't care about gender politics love it. All of my progressive and feminist friends love this movie and they think that it's subversive, but I can't really tell if this is like a 90s attempt at making a feminist romantic comedy or if this is like a 90s backlash against feminism. It seems kind of to be both. And that's the big overarching issue that I think everything has to be couched in terms of because the question is, yeah, is this a feminist statement? Is this a subversive feminist romantic comedy? Or is this just the same old bullshit, but with this weird icing on top of it that doesn't really fit? And I want to know, are the opening credits the kind of key to unpacking that? Because was that literally how they sold this to Ani DeFranco, that this is going to be a subversive romantic comedy because that's kind of what the opening credits are right i mean because ani defranco singing this song about to be a good wife basically you have to shut up and and just kiss him and hold him and make him feel good right wear your hair the way he likes and wear the clothes he likes and have his dinner ready and these are all suggestions and and the girls have these love that joker look on their faces for most <laughs> of the entire uh opening number I really wonder, you know, was that kind of the point that this is a feminist icon doing something so ridiculous and simply because it's Ani DeFranco? Because if you didn't know it was Ani DeFranco singing that, it would just be a cutesy, non-feminist statement. But her doing it makes it a feminist statement, right? Yeah. It does. She's a feminist icon. But that's the only thing that makes it ironic. Like, it, if you don't know that that's her, why would you think that there's irony there? And I think most people don't even know who she is. Except Dan Byrne. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few things about this movie that I will concede are subversive. Now, I don't think that the movie's politics are subversive but i think that it does subvert some of the norms of the romantic comedy genre one of the norms of the genre that it subverts is normally your protagonist your heroine is the one that winds up with the guy and in this case our protagonist on our heroine is actually the normal villain She's normally the one yes. who creates the conflict in the romantic comedy. It's sort of got like a, uh, you know, a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead thing going on there in that we're actually watching the entire story from the perspective of what would normally be a relatively minor character. If we were to actually watch this movie from the perspective of Michael, Dermot Mulroney, and Kimmy, Cameron Diaz... This would actually be a totally normal and slightly boring romantic comedy with all of the exact same complaints that you would have about any other romantic comedy. So telling it from a different perspective is slightly subversive of the genre, but I don't think so of the underlying principles behind the genre. There are some really key moments in the film, I think, where they try to kind of clue you in that they're maybe wanting to do something different. You know, I often wonder whenever a movie feels like it's at odds with itself, if there were early audience feedbacks that made them put in different scenes or change things around a little bit. I think the absolute key to this movie is Rupert Everett. Because Rupert Everett is fucking awesome, and he is the only really sane one out of the bunch, excepting maybe Cameron Diaz's parents, because I really like them. Right. I mean, he's the sane one. He's the one who is like, you know, she says, because he keeps telling her, just tell him the truth. Tell him the truth that you're in love with him. Stop running around like a fucking crazy romantic comedy heroine and just act like a decent, normal human being. I also wrote in my notes... George is the only sane person in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he is almost an audience figure, because I, I felt, because he says exactly what I was thinking, because she asks him, what's going to happen when I tell him? And he says, he'll choose Kim, and you'll say goodbye. 
and and that's what has to happen because there's no reason you know it's never revealed that say kim is using him for some reason or lying to him for some reason or da 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 da, da. i mean we get the red herring of she's she's so young right i mean he's 28 she's 20 and still in college but there's never anything more than that the reason why i felt the movie failed on that level however i i thought was highlighted by the fact that they all three of them go out to a karaoke bar and there's this moment where julia roberts and dermot i'm just gonna call him dermot because if we try to call him michael it's gonna get really confusing here julia roberts and dermot because they've known each other for most of their lives start having in jokes and cameron diaz feels really left out right and i was like why don't dermot and cameron diaz have their own in jokes right you know they they had this crazy whirlwind romance that was so intense that within what a month he asked her to marry him it's not really clear they don't tell us how long they've been seeing each other it can't really have been that sudden because one like that big ass church that they rented just from having planned one wedding myself i can tell you that you can't just walk in and say hey can we get married on thursday <laughs> at a place like that you have to book that a year in advance at the very least somebody spent like Five weeks just blowing up all those fucking helium balloons, I can guarantee you. <laughs> but this was actually something that didn't really work for me and I was very confused about. Like, supposedly Dermot is her best friend, right? They're best friends and they're secretly yes. in love. Something that we'll talk about later that annoyed me also. But he tells his best friend... I'm getting married in 72 hours. The explanation that they give is that one of them was on a book tour and so for, or whatever, and so for a month they've stayed out of contact. And that's why I'm saying it, it has to have been uh, less than a month, maybe a little bit more than that. It could be that he had said, oh, I'm dating this girl, she's too young for me, and it only really got serious in the past month. But the proposal had to have happened within the past month. Dermot proposing to her, not the movie, the proposal. <laughs> yeah, they did say that she had written a book and then literally never said another word about it. I wrote a book because I guess my job allows me to do that or something. Or something. Her career is not really important here. Shh, shh, shh. It's not. All we know is that she's a very important eater. Yes. I thought that was interesting that the movie starts out like after those god-fucking bizarre opening credits with her eating bacon and everybody just in hushed kind of reverence staring at it. And it was like this, I, that played into, I think general romance, just like but, you know, women love to eat food and talk about men. And, and that's kind of big thing in this movie. Other things that appear to be part of the genre always jokes, apparently about tits, not being big enough for dresses. Like, that's something that we've seen multiple times now. That is mm. apparently a big thing that a romantic comedy needs. Women being clumsy, that's a very, that's a huge one on there. I wonder how often that is the case. Because, like, I thought that it was, like, something that maybe was setting apart Good Luck Chuck was to have Jessica Alba be clumsy like that. But here, she winds up flat on her back six times, and yet there are no sex scenes. I guess every woman just feels extremely clumsy. And so they have to, they have to play up on that. Something that I thought was possibly subverting is that Rupert Everett's character is gay. Right. If Rupert Everett's character had been straight, this movie would have ended with them becoming romantically entwined, right? And then we still get the hia, as they call it in the romance business, the happily ever after. You think that having George be gay was a subversive thing for them to do rather than have her rather than have him be a female character? Having him be this character who obviously loves her more than she deserves, right? Kind of no matter what, he's there. And she is quite clearly a monster. Yes. Because of that, it felt like, what is the narrative purpose of this character being gay, except for that she can't have a happy ending? To show that she doesn't relate to women. They, If he were okay, yeah. a straight man, then they would have to wind up together. Although, honestly, if he were a straight man and they didn't wind up together, I would find that more subversive. Because one of the things that I find irritating about this movie is the implicit assumption that 
men and women, if their sexual orientations are such that they are sexually attracted to, to each other's gender, they can't be friends. You cannot be friends with anyone who is of the gender that you're sexually attracted to, which of course means that bisexual people just can't have friends at all because the sex will <laughs> always ruin it. They can just have tons of friends with benefits. But the underlying assumption that you can't be friends with someone if you're sexually attracted to their gender, it must be because you've been secretly in love with them for a decade. I agree. That's basically what the movie posits. But what's interesting about that though is that nobody in the movie seems to question that assumption it's only kind of the movie speaking to the audience that does that because I was really shocked by just how completely trusting Cameron Diaz is in this movie because it's like oh you're a female best friend who you used to date and I know that you've been sexually active with and this is like one of the kind of most tension-filled moments in your life where people do stupid shit and you want to like spend the day with her and everything that's fine they did say later in the climactic bathroom scene no one's ever strung those words together before <laughs> that she didn't trust her right that she knew that she was going to try to pull but, but something. there was no proof of that through the entire film also, none of the family question the fact that, that Dermot had a female best friend. He goes into the room while she's changing and keeps the door open enough so that anybody could see that he's in with Julia Roberts nearly unclothed, and that right. doesn't seem like a big deal. It felt like everybody was just completely comfortable with the fact that he had a female best friend. None of the characters seem to question that, but the movie certainly does. Another kind of similar note is, like, one of the things, again, that people point to as evidence of this movie being subversive is during the big chase sh scene when she's stolen a catering truck and is chasing Dermot, who's chasing Cameron Diaz through the city streets of Chicago. And incidentally, I watched this with my girlfriend who's from Chicago and she's like, there's no way you'd get between those two places that fast. <laughs> no fucking way. But she's on the phone with George. And he says, with Rupert Everett, and he says, give it up, you're not the one. No one's chasing you because you're not the one. And people say, look, Julia Roberts is not the one. But the underlying assumption, again, is that there is a the one. It's just Cameron Diaz is the one because Cameron Diaz is young and pretty and willing to give up her career and willing to change herself and mold herself to fit his life and dreams instead of having her own. She fulfills the opening credits song. Exactly. Uh, some people think that even to have this conflict at all is progressive, but I don't think that it sells it, which is that in order to be with Dermot and for him to continue pursuing his dream of being a journalist, he needs to travel a lot, which means... She needs to quit school in order to be with him. She has a dream of being an architect, but she has to give that up so that he can continue to make crappy money as a traveling sports journalist. And she doesn't want to do that, and they haven't talked about it. And it's just an assumption that she is going to give up school in order for him to have his dream because his dream is the one that matters. Her dream does not. Yeah, they kind of touch on that a little bit because, like, Julia Roberts towards the end... Uh, after having tried to push a wedge in because of that issue, she says to Cameron Diaz something like, I'm the cause of this. I, I tried to push that wedge. And Cameron says, no, I, I, you know, the reason that it was so upsetting is because I do have these reservations. I, I don't really want to quit college. I mean, there's this live, vibrant love story that we just aren't really privy to in this movie. I thought it was kind of annoying, just sort of the way that was handled in the restaurant scene, because that was her first scheme, was to convince Cameron Diaz that Dermot Mulroney would be willing to give up his dream in order to let her pursue hers, that he might entertain that notion. Like, that's all she did. All she did was convince Cameron Diaz to ask for what she really wanted in life. And of course, Dermot Mulroney yeah. explodes. He berates her loudly in a very public place. He says that she made him look like an insensitive, sexist asshole, which she didn't really make him look that way. <laughs> he did a pretty good job of it himself. Um, and of course, she breaks down and she blubbers and she cries and she apologizes for even asking for what it is that she wants in, in life and in their relationship. Again, though, I really felt as if there was probably a second part to that conversation that we didn't get to see that happened once their tempers had calmed down. 
Possibly, except that towards the end when Julia Roberts is playing go-between between the two of them, she again apologizes for even bringing it up. That whole go-between scene where she's essentially giving confession to both of them because they're the wedding is off and they're they're both upset and she goes in between and, and she's kind of trying to confess to what she's done but talking around it because she's a horrible person and blah 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 and that's where I was like this is Godfather 2 because you know we've got a huge wedding right and that's a uh, that's a place where the Godfather movies usually either begin or end, <laughs> and uh, and and we've got someone being a confessor and taking a plunge down a moral vacuum. If this had been your typical romantic comedy, and she had been the one, then all of that would have been fine, right? All of this shit that happened would have just been a funny story that they would tell their grandkids. Like, the movie yes. doesn't really push on the fact that Julia Roberts is being batshit fucking insane and behaving in a way that is absolutely unacceptable in polite society. It's just treated that, as, that's what you do when you're in love sometimes. Sometimes love's a little sometimes bit Sometimes love's a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that does seem to be a theme, doesn't it? She, yeah, she's gonna she's gonna put on the penguin suit and show up <laughs> at his work here soon. That's something that I did keep thinking about was because the movie tries to trick you a lot. There are certain scenes that feel like they have I I felt the ring of truth, like the scene where Dermot and Julia Roberts are in the boat and they're talking about how long they've known each other and their interaction, and he says something like. When the timing is right, you have to act on something. If you let the moment pass you by, then it's gone forever. And it's filmed in such a way that you feel this is her moment. She could be truthful here, and possibly they could be together. And she doesn't, and the moment passes, and you're like, okay. And and it's things like that have the ring of truth. And then, on, But then on the other hand, it does kind of try to keep tricking you that she could get him. That's, I think, why the ending is supposed to feel so subversive and crazy, because she doesn't get him. But from the beginning, I'm like, if she gets him, this is just fucking nuts of a, you know, like, because there's no reason that she would. Right. If he were actually secretly in love with her and this was a thing, he wouldn't be getting married to Cameron Diaz. Well, I, I think that the message we're supposed to get there is that he sort of is, that he is in love with her and that he's just sort of given up. Like, he's eventually given up and he's settled. Right, and, and that kind of the, part of the reason that he's invited her here is to give her a chance to be open and honest. And I have to admit, I, I think this was a really difficult role for somebody to play, and I thought Dermot did a decent job. Because you can never be sure of his motivations at any point in the movie. There's nothing written for him, so... <laughs> he has to be the cipher through which you, you can both see, okay, this is a man who's in love and wanting to get married, versus, okay, this is a man who's in love and desperately doesn't want to get married to Cameron Diaz. I thought Dermot's main way of showing that his character was someone you couldn't really, like, connect to was by switching accents every five seconds scenes or so <laughs> i was like what is he australian southern what the hell that was another thing i was never quite sure where he was from because not chicago is really the only thing that we know right at one point in the middle of the movie when they're all out to lunch they randomly break into song and everyone seems to know the words and a piano music magically appears <laughs> uh-oh i think it's happening here too you ready michael <laughs> No. Come on. I I don't. <laughs> the first line is know. yours. Wait, 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 wait for it to uh, come back around again. Okay. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that scene, like I hate musicals oddly, but I love whenever <laughs> an unscripted song or dance shows up in a movie, and so I really enjoyed that scene. But oh my god. The best part about that scene is the thing that starts it is George, Rupert Everett, telling a story. And I absolutely love the way that they wrote Rupert Everett during that whole section because essentially he's told Julia Roberts, be honest with him. You have to be honest with him. And I'm going to fuck with you until you do. He gives her a chance. She completely lies, says that he's there because she's actually getting married to him and blah, 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 blah. And he's like... 
all right, you're going to be a stupid bitch. I'm going to fuck with you to no end. And so he just starts telling the family crazy shit. I love that. He was a fairly minor character that really made the movie pretty enjoyable for me. And another pair of characters that I really enjoyed in this movie, and no one else even seems to remember them, are Kimmy's cousins. What, what are they called? Revengeful they call bitches or whatever? The vengeful sluts. There we um, go. The names yeah. are Samantha and Amanda Newsom, and they're actually called Vengeful Sluts twice in the movie. Once by Kimmy, which I found kind of irritating, and <laughs> the second time by themselves. They introduce themselves as the Vengeful Sluts in a sort of ironic way, which means that they know that their family calls them that. Yeah. But they continued to be brazen and open with their sexuality because there's the whole line about like they're talking about you know scoring with the groomsmen and they're like stay away from the short chubby hairy one he's mine yes i really liked those two characters but the movie really treats them like shit and the movie really slut shames them and yeah. it really expects us to slut shame them as well we're not supposed to like them but they're like my favorite characters in the entire movie well it's one of them that gets stuck performing fellatio on the ice sculpture right right and you know what's funny is that a similar incident or a male character with similar attitudes regarding sex would be treated as totally normal but these two are treated as just totally beyond the pale sexual deviance and promiscuous and so i thought that that was actually really shined a light into the politics of the movie and showed that it, the movie itself is actually not very feminist was the way it treated those two characters and there was another thing that I noticed, and this is something I've been paying attention to ever since we noticed what a good job the proposal did with the ethnic diversity of the ancillary cast. How many speaking parts do you think there were for non-white people that were not in food service? I don't remember a single one. I'll guess one. There is exactly one. It is in the climactic bathroom scene. There is a black woman in there who says to Jules, Bitch, that is the <laughs> one word spoken by a person of color who is not working in food service in this movie. It, it doesn't surprise me. Let, let's talk some more about that bathroom scene because I agree with you with everything that you're saying here. And I really feel that that bathroom scene was meant to be like the big moment in the movie where it's like, this is a feminist statement, right? Because Cameron Diaz is like, you're a fucking bitch and I knew what you were up to all along, basically. Mm -hmm. It doesn't ring true for me. Oh, and we also have all the women around who are the target demographic for a movie starring Julia Roberts doing shit like this, right? And, and they are all, like, disgusted by her. Right. But then because we kind of need to wrap it up and get to the end of the movie, they all forgive her because Kimmy forgives her and gives her a hug or whatever. You know, if, if you really wanted to make this movie like a feminist statement and have that scene be shockingly subversive, they should stone her to death. Yeah, they, they should absolutely not soften up and give her a pass because it, it's not like she's done little things here like she has basically tried to ruin Kimmy's life in addition to the fact that Kimmy is willing to ruin her own life for a guy I mean there's just so many things wrong about Kimmy's part in this it's like my other thought was I, I guess maybe not most newlyweds but many married couples live apart for a good portion of the year right so why would it have been that difficult for her to stay in school and him just to like pop in on weekends or whatever yeah, especially since she's filthy fucking rich and she can just fly yeah. wherever he happens to be every weekend, presumably in their private Learjet. This movie also has a fake wedding story in it. We get a fake story oh, yeah. about the proposal. So I don't know if that is a trope of the genre or not. It's starting to look like it could possibly be, huh? Yeah, that's interesting that that's such a... That's something they fall back on. We'll have to watch and see if that shows up in others. You know, there are a lot of things that date this movie, like, for instance, the email <laughs> <laughs> right. section where nobody needs an at or a dot com. It's just George <laughs> to Smith. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> the thing that really made it feel old to me was the fact that people were just smoking all over the place. Yeah, the, the giant cell phones. Also, there's a the character uh, kind of at the nadir of the lead character's emotional arc who comes in to give folksy wisdom. That's kind of a, a trope, right? Paul Giamatti. In some ways, the movie is a little bit radical. Our heroine doesn't get the guy. She doesn't get her happily ever after or her... Yeah! <laughs> 
it's a radical enough thing to do in a romantic comedy that it actually, to my knowledge, hasn't happened since to where the heroine does not get her happily ever after at the end. Maybe somebody out there is more familiar with the genre and can provide me with a counterexample, but I don't know of any. It depicts that love and relationships can sometimes be really messy and scary and confusing, and there's not always a clear path. Even for our hero, Dermot Mulroney in this one, like he doesn't actually really know what he wants, and that runs count contrary to the rom-com ethos. But I think underneath it all, it's actually reinforcing the underlying assumptions that rom-coms are built on and i think that by doing that it actually undermines the values that people who think it's subversive believe it's engendering it tries to pastiche the genre so hard that it just ends up being another entry into the genre if in fact that's what it's even doing i think the jury is still out on whether or not it's even attempting to do that ani defranco singing wishing and hoping I, that to me <laughs> That's the key. And I think you're given that key very early on to understand what they're doing, but I do think it's still kind of up in the air. They were not necessarily trying to subvert the romantic comedy genre or the underlying assumptions behind it, but it seems as though kind of what they were doing was trying to make a romantic comedy that will appeal to people who hate romantic comedies. So it will pretend that it also hates romantic comedies. Yes. This movie promises you a dollar and gives you 78 cents. <laughs> so without further ado, let's ask our closing question here. Wilford, if you had to change one thing about this movie to make it much, much better, what would that be? Basically, what I would do is I would restructure the narrative format of the movie so that all of the stuff that we see happening is actually being told in the form of flashbacks during courtroom testimony for Julia Roberts' trial, mm. because she clearly committed electronic mail fraud, she stole that catering van, and then you get to introduce the whole unreliable narrative element, because like she can tell her side, and it'll look like a romantic comedy, and then like somebody else can tell their side, and it'll look like a suspenseful thriller, because there's this crazy bitch after them. I think that would be <laughs> really interesting to show the two different opposite perspectives there. The other thing I would do is Samantha and Amanda Newhouse get their their own movie vengeful sluts <laughs> i like that idea i uh for me <laughs> i think i would just go darker in act three you know dermot mulroney would come in and find julia roberts chewing on cameron diaz's heart oh i thought you were gonna say masturbating with a grapefruit <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and she's like, uh, you know, she's like, she had such a big heart. Now I've got it too, <laughs> something like that. And then she tries to like capture him and tie him to a chair or whatever, you know, something like that. <laughs> I, I think I would have went darker with it. But I, I think that would have been a, a much better giveaway than the bathroom scene that they were trying to make uh, an anti-romance movie. But that didn't happen. <laughs> so. So all we get is this movie instead. <laughs> Right. That's enough for now, I think. So if you have any comments, questions, feedback of any sort, then please feel free to write to info at iceonmars.net. I also very strongly encourage you to rate and review because that please, is the way that we get noticed. Please, please, please. And that way we won't have to revert to, say, ads or killing your mom. Or porn. That's not a reversion. <laughs> Don't call it a comeback. <laughs> so for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. Goodbye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars.